2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 11. O Corinthians, we have spoken. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now in return for the same, I speak as to children. You also be open. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. The title of today's message is, Who's Your Daddy? Because, wow, I didn't expect that kind of reaction. <laughs> let, me, let me say it again. Today's title, Who's Your Daddy? Um, I, 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 I share that because right there at the end, he says, I will be your father. But so many of us reject him as our father. And so we, we adopt other fathers in our lives. We adopt other things and people we want to follow instead of following our heavenly father. And, 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 and it can come in a lot of different forms and, and a lot of times they're blessings to us. Now, I, I mentioned the very opening in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. He says, you have many teachers in Christ, but you have few fathers. He goes on, for I have begotten you. He's speaking, I have begotten you in the spirit. I have fathered you in the spirit. And, and, and this is the thing that I, I always love to kind of emphasize, like I said, to all men, happy Father's Day. Because you can, you can birth someone spiritually. We all have fathers in our lives. And, and, and whenever I, you know, I, I think about this, like who's your daddy, I, there's this one scene that always comes to mind for me. And it's from a, mo- a movie called Remember the Titans. And I got a little video clip here. If you've never seen Remember the Titans, it's, it's about a football team, and I think it's in uh, Virginia, maybe West Virginia, I forget. But it's right after the days of, of, of integration, and, and, and they're, they're bringing uh, a traditionally all- a black school together with an all-white school, and, and they're bringing them together. And this is a, an interaction with the football coach and some of the players uh, from that scene. So if I can have your attention on the monitors, please. Uh. I'm going to help you boys. I'm Gary Bertier, the only All-American you've got on this team. You want any of us to play for you, you reserve half the open positions for Hammond players. Half the offense, half the special teams. We don't need any of your people on defense. We're already set. Uh Uh-huh. Don't need none of my people. Mm Mm-hmm. What do you say your name was, uh, Jerry? Gary. No, you must have said Jerry like Lewis, which would make you Dean Martin, right? Ladies and gentlemen, got an announcement to make. We got Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin going to camp with us here this year. Jerry tells the jokes, Dean sings the songs, and gets the girl. Let's give him a round of applause. Which folks? Gary. Parents, are they here? Where are they? That's my mother. That's your mama? Mm-hmm. Very nice, I want you. Take a good look at her. Because once you get on that bus, you ain't got no mama no more. You got your brothers on the team. Daddy. Now, you know who your daddy is, don't you? Gary, if you want to play on this football team, you answer me when I ask you, who is your daddy? Who's your daddy, Gary? Who's your daddy? You. Uh Uh-huh. And whose team is this? Is this your team, or is this your daddy's team? Yours. Mm Mm-hmm. Get on the bus. Put your jacket on first. And get on the bus. Uh, Dean? <laughs> Fix that tie, son. I, I just wanted to emphasize the question, right? Who's your daddy? Is your heavenly father your daddy? 
Or are you following somebody else, something else? In many cases, and if we look at our culture today, and though the world does not want to admit it and acknowledge it, but a lot of the challenges we have in our society today with crime and drug use is oftentimes because of an absent father. And these young people are running around not knowing who their daddy is and not having anyone to point them in the direction of what's right. I love that scene there when, he, when the one guy's walking away and he calls him Dean. I didn't forget, I didn't forget the real character's name. I just you know, know him as Dean. Says, Dean, fix your tie, son. Even in his correction, he was still respecting the young man, trying to help him to straighten up, to walk straight, to, be, to, to do the right thing. And, and, and fathers do that in our lives. And I, I found it very interesting that this month that's known as Pride Month, which there's a lot of things wrong with that because the Lord frowns upon pride. He tells us that, that pride leads to destruction. But yet the world is celebrating it. And it didn't occur to me until this morning that the month in which the world celebrates pride is the month that we celebrate fathers. It's the, to me, the antithesis. It's the attack. It's the antichrist. Because fathers are needed to help mold, even, even daughters. Fathers help mold, and I say help. Because mothers have a huge contribution in that effort as well. But hopefully that my example, your example, even to your daughters, can show your daughters what to expect and look for in a man. That the, how you present yourself and carry yourself is an example for them to follow. And so that they don't, they don't settle for something. I mean, I hope they don't settle for less than me. I mean, they should be you know, looking for higher standards and higher goals and objectives. But, but we, we all have this, this role to play, but if we're not there, we can't teach them. And this is why so many people are now are running around confused about who they are and, and, and how they should identify. Because no one's, no one's explaining it for them and showing them. And, and, and I say this month, I, I, again, it wasn't until this morning that it really hit me that it's this month that we honor fathers. It's where they celebrate the, the breakup the, the destroying of the family, saying we don't, we don't need a family. We, we, can, we can identify any way we want to be. We can be anything we want to be and not have to follow. It's funny. They like to say, follow the, the, cult, the cultural constructs. But really, what's the greater social construct? They're, they're the, an un, ungodly lifestyles, ungodly activities and habits. That's a social construct. To, to, normalize, to normalize drug use in some cities where they, they, they provide paraphernalia for drug use to help them with their habits. That's, that's, that's a social construct. Not when God tells you be sober-minded. When God tells you repent of what you're doing. Or in all these other issues that are going on with, 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 with a gender dysphoria and, and reassigning genders. Those, those, are, those, are social, those are social constructs. Those do not fall in line with the natural order of things. And I know, that, I know this may get me some hate mail, maybe get our, our message censored on YouTube, but that's the reality of it. And again, so it, it all comes, I think, why? It, it, it's coming this month. And you know, in this month, I, I had a wonderful opportunity to celebrate, help celebrate a, in, in both these cases, in both these men's lives, they're both great grandfathers and husbands, and and they, they're, I got to celebrate their their home going, going to be with the Lord. Jeb Ohio, I, I I got to share it at his at his celebration of life services this month, and to hear his kids honor him and give thanks for the life that he lived and the example he provided, it was moving and inspiring. And just a couple days ago. I was with the Battenfield family, and I, I had to go up to, to, to Penny, or actually I went up to uh, Sherry bef- during the song service and said, can I share about your dad's story? Because he just went on to be with the Lord, and, and I got to see the love. I, I, I look at the fruit of the tree. 
I always like to, because it reads in, in Matthew chapter 7 that a good tree bears good fruit. And a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. And so I always look at the fruit. And when the fruit is good, then I know the tree is good. And, and I remember hearing Sherry and Penny tell this wonderful story minutes, minutes before their father passed. Minutes, he says, I got to go. Now, he's been in hospice. He, hadn't been, he can't get out of bed. But he says, I got to go. And he threw the sheets off of himself. And then a few minutes later, he went on to be with the Lord. Thinking, how beautiful is that? That he knew that the Lord was, was there for him. That he was going to go and be with the Lord. And, I sat and, I, and they told me that, that I heard that story and I was just filled with chills. You know, just like, oh my goodness, that is amazing. That he knew. He knew that the Lord, it was his time. He's going with the Lord. I was like, if I don't go in my sleep, I want to go like that. I do, and I just thought, and I thought, what, what a great example. And to see them just speak so fondly of their father. Hearing Michael speak so fondly about his father and, and, and the lessons they learned from them. And these are the things that I hope to, desire, I hope to leave for my kids someday. But I, I, I want to share with you some, uh, some fatherly examples. And I'm going to share with you some fatherly examples. And forgive me if it sounds pretentious, but about my father. Now, but you got to understand I'm going to share about my father, and then I'm going to share about three kings from the Bible, okay, to give you some perspective here. Now, my father was not raised in the things of the Lord. In fact, I did not even learn until after my dad, in, I think he was about 69 when he came to the Lord, 68, 69, when my dad came to the Lord. I didn't really learn until then. I had thought he had always been a Catholic all his life. And he says, no, I wasn't. He goes, I only went and did all that Catholic stuff to marry your mother because otherwise they wouldn't let me marry her in the Catholic church. So he did all the, but he had, my dad had no sense of God. And he was, he was a true agnostic. He didn't, he didn't have any type of spiritual upbringing, none. But when he, when he met my mother and, and she wanted to get married in the Catholic church, then he went and did all the sacraments to convert to Catholicism. But he really didn't know anything. And, and so I, I want to share some, some examples of my dad and, and because there's a lesson here in all this. He did not know the Lord. But my dad taught me to work. He, he every day God went to work. I was 33 years old before the first time I encountered my dad ever calling in sick to work. I was 33. Every day when I, when I left for school, he was already gone at work. Every day when I came home from school, he was still at work. Most nights, he went off to his part-time job to work. And he, he used to tell us, well, he didn't tell, he told me once, and it just stuck with me. He says, if you can get up and get to the phone to call in sick, you can get up and go to work. And that was, that was his mindset, and that's how he did things. I remember there were times when, when things were really tough on us financially. He had, he had worked for this one job, and there was, you know, uh, they decided to strike, and so they went on strike, and, and my dad, he went out and got, he already had a part-time job. He went out and got two more part-time jobs, so he was working three part-time jobs to try to make ends meet for our household because he knew he had to go, and he, he had to work. He, he'd tell me, he said, son, he goes, he said, he said, son, he goes, your jobs make your boss's job easier. If they want you to clean the toilets, then you're going to be the highest paid toilet cleaner out there. You want, they want you to sweep the warehouse, you sweep the warehouse. And, that, and that's the way, and, that, and that's how, that's, he had no biblical instruction to do that. He just needed to do that. Exodus 35, 2 reads, six days shall you work. The word calls us to work six days. And my dad fulfilled that in more ways than one. He was an honest man. Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2 who may dwell on the holy hill? He who walks uprightly, works righteously, and speaks truth in his heart. Now, this is a story that could be a bit embarrassing. Um, maybe, maybe for my kids, if they were to hear the story. But during those times when things were really tight for us, and you might remember there was a time when there used to be collection agencies. They used to come to your actual door and knock on the door and say, hey, we're here to collect. You need some money. And sometimes, and no, nothing against my mom, but she would, she would run and hide, go, go to the bathroom and say, tell him I'm in the bathroom. 
which wasn't a lie, as she was running to the bathroom, tell him I'm in the bathroom, I can't talk now. So I would answer the door, and they would sit there and tell me what they were there for. And when one day, my dad happened to be there when one of these collectors came by the house. And I remember, because I was used to always going to go to the door and try to cover up. And my dad answered the door, and he said he was a so-and-so to collect the money. And, and the, the bill wasn't a lot. It was like 20-something dollars. But this is the early 70s, and you know, maybe that was a lot for them. But I remember my dad reached into his pocket, and he had a dollar thirty-seven, And he says, I have a dollar thirty-seven. Can you take this and apply it to the account? And he says, Mr. Obergon, he says, that's not enough. That isn't... He says, that's all I have. He says, right now, $2 is a lot of money. So this is all I have. Can you take that and just apply it, and I'll work on getting you the rest. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't come up with a, an excuse or a lie. He's like, this is what I have. And I remember hearing him say that, and he says, if you would ask me for $2, that's a lot of money for me right now. He was honest. And then through all this, my dad would, had told me this. He said, son, he says, control your credit. Don't let your credit control you. And that's Proverbs 22, 7. If you ever read that, it reads, it reads that the borrower is slave to the lender. So here are some biblical lessons that I'm learning from my dad. I didn't even know they were biblical. Not until I come to Christ and I read these things, I'm like, oh my goodness, my dad was doing this stuff. He already knew this stuff. He had respectful speech. The word calls for respectful speech. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt word proceed from your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. No corrupt word. This is, this is, up until middle school, I thought blasted was a swear word. Because the TV was on the brink or the car broke down, oh, the blasted TV, the blasted car. I thought blasted was a swear word. I did. I did not know until I got to middle school when people were saying other things. And I'm saying, well, yeah, blasted. And they're like, blasted? Well, that's what my dad says when things break. I never heard ever. Now, my dad was a Marine. He'd been, my dad was over in Vietnam in 59 before it was official conflict. Been in the Philippines. He had served sea duty. So he, he's on sea duty. So he's with sailors too, all right? In in, in foreign ports, all right? I never heard my dad swear, ever, 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 ever. A non-believer, a non-believer in Christ. Never swore. He demonstrated to me about being all things to all people, as Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians 9.22. Right? He says, be all things to all people that you may save some. And I saw this firsthand. I was a, I was a young teenager and one of the part-time jobs my dad had was at this local, this local pizza place. And in this pizza place, they served, they had a, they had a bar with just beer and wine. And uh, I remember going by there to get up a pizza or something, and, and I saw him talking to this biker. And this is, again, this is in the, you know, the 70s, the late 70s. And, you know, there wasn't one of these, like, <laughs> to say this, it wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't like an actual biker, like a biker gang member, okay? Not a you know, he had an actual cut and, you know, no, none of these wannabe stuff. Forgive me if I offend anybody. But, and, and my dad's there, and he's talking to this guy, and they're, this biker and my dad are, are sitting there laughing, having a good time. My dad's pouring him a pitcher of beer, giving him a couple glasses, and they're laughing, having a good time, and I'm watching this. And then right after he goes away, uh, and this doesn't sound like a joke, but then a priest comes up who, who had a, I know, a priest and a biker walk into a bar. And the priest, walk, he's there with a youth group from the local, local parish, and the priest walks up to get pitchers of soda for the kids he has there. And then my dad's there joking and laughing with the priest. I'm thinking, okay, what's he saying to the biker? He's got the biker laughing. And what's he saying to the priest? He's got the priest laughing. But he just had this way of just kind of getting along with people and, and being friendly. And I, and I saw these things, and I admired it. Our God is also a present God. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. Deuteronomy 31.6, it reads that he will not leave you or he'll never forsake you. Remember in high school, and this is the early 80s, and, and this was in the early days of the, the Crip and Blood gang wars in L.A. getting really violent, really bad, and, and they were having these violent outbreaks at football games on Friday nights. So they were moving games to the daytime. 
here in the LA uh, school district. And so we had a, a daytime game and it was like at one or two in the afternoon. I mean, they, they wanted the game played where even the kids from school couldn't be in the stands, all right? And uh, so it was a daytime game and I just come off the field and I went to get some water at the water jug because it's, you know, it's afternoon. And I look up and there's one person up in the stands on the visitor bleacher because we're, we're the visiting team. And my dad is on the very last bleacher, the very, the very last aisle of the, of, the, of the stands. And he made some arrangements at work to be there to see me play. This is a man who didn't know the Lord and said, I'm going to be there for my son. The only person in the stands that day was my dad. He was there. After I get married, I was uh, uh, still heavy into cycling, and uh, Yvette and I were expecting our first son. Uh, she, Yvette's about seven, almost eight months pregnant, and I'm working out with some brothers from church who go on a bike ride from L.A. to San Diego. That's a 120-mile bike ride. And we're at, we're at the house mapping it out, and Yvette's going to be our support car. She's going to meet us a couple stops along the way to refresh us with fresh bottles of water, and, and we're, we're mapping this out. My dad shows up at the house when we're working on this, and he says, what are you doing? I explained to him what we're doing. He says, well, can I come? He just, he, just want, he, he, he was still being dad. Oh, he coached me. I don't know how my dad had multiple jobs, coached us all kids, coached us in sports, was there. I, I, don't, I don't know how he did it. I, I don't think he slept. I, I don't, I, he, he couldn't have slept. I, I don't understand. I don't know how he did it. But now I want to move into the scriptures. I'm going to share with you a story about three kings, Manasseh, Amon, and Josiah. Manasseh is the father of Amon, who is the father of Josiah. So basically a grandfather, father, and son, okay? And, and we're going to do some reading here because I want you to hear, I want you to read, I want you to see what this is like. Now, mind you, Manasseh is the son of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good and faithful king. But Manasseh, here, listen to Manasseh. Chapter 21 of 2 Kings, in verse number 1. We're going to do some reading here, but I, I want you to hear it. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hevzibah. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So he was as wicked and as evil as the pagans that were cast out of Canaan, Okay. For he, listen, for he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. He raised up altars for Baal, and he made a wooden image as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. And he worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and he served them. It's not, it's not bad enough to worship pagan gods, but now he's building these altars to these pagan gods. He also built altars in the house of the Lord, in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven and the two courts of the house of the Lord. Also, he made his son pass through the fire, practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft, and consulted spiritists and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke to him to this, much, this much anger. Going to verse number 11, same chapter. Because Manasseh, king of Judah, had done these abominations... He has acted more wickedly than all the Amorites who were before him and has also made Judah sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such calamity upon Jerusalem and Judah that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle. And I will stretch out over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria, the plummet of the house of Ahab. I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish wiping it and turning it upside down. This basically is speaking to the exile that's going to come. He's going to exile all of Israelites to the Babylonians because of, of what he has done. And, and you can see this in Jeremiah 15, 4, where Manasseh is credited for the reason for the exile. But, but I, I, want, I, want, I want you to hear some more of what he does. For, in verse 14, 
So I will forsake the remnant, my inheritance, and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. That's the exile I just mentioned. And they shall become victims of plunder of all their enemies because they have done evil in my sight and have provoked me uh, to anger ever since the day of their fathers came out of Egypt, even to this day. And then moving to verse number uh, 11 of chapter 22. I got ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Um, chapter, verse 19. This is the part, verse 19. I'm sorry. 2 Kings 21, verse 19. Amon was 22 years old. So now this is his son. This is his son, Amon. Amon was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. Two years is where he reigned. His, his mother's name was Meshulamith. I don't know. Sounds like a meth head. <laughs> <sighs> sorry. And... And he did, and he did, sorry, and he did evil. Oh, Lord, help me. Help these people, Lord. It's not their fault they're here. Uh, so he, and he did evil on the side of the Lord as his father Manasseh had done. So Amon followed his father Manasseh, and he did evil. So he walked in all the ways that his father had walked, and he served the idols that his father had served, and he worshiped them. So Manasseh has done all this evil, and ended up um, passing it on. Yes, passing on the lessons to his son Amon, who only served twenty-three years. Only served two years. And verse twenty-three, people had had all these years of Manasseh and all his wickedness. I was trying to find because Manasseh is the one that had them walk through the fire of Molech. That's why. I, that's why I was hesitant before. I was trying to find that spot. Manasseh had his children walk through the fire of Molech. That means Manasseh had sacrificed his kids to this god, Molech. This is what a king of Israel was doing this. A king of Judah was, was sacrificing his kids to Molech. Amen. So the people had seen this. Amen's in, in, on the throne for two years. The people have had enough. In verse 23, the people conspire and they assassinate Amen. Amen is killed. Then Amen's son, Josiah, who is only eight years old in 2 Kings, is placed as king. He's eight years old, mind you. Now I want to pick up when Josiah is now 16 years old in chapter 22 and verse 11. This is Josiah now. Josiah is the great-grandson of Manasseh, the one who, who's, who offered sacrifices to Molech. And this is what it reads of Josiah. He's only 16 at this point. Now what happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes, or in the King James, the old King James, he rent. That was a sign of mourning. He mourned, he was grieved, he was saddened because he heard the word of God and he knew what they were doing was wrong. And it grieved his spirit and he, ri he ripped his clothes, he ripped his garment. And then this is what he did. And, and jumping down to the next chapter, chapter 23 and verse number one, and it reads, now the king set them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to them. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and with all him, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing. He read in their hearing. Why? Because in Romans 10, 17, it is written that faith cometh by hearing. Josiah heard the word. He rent his garment. His faith was, his faith was kindled when he heard the word of God. And so now he knows the people need the word of God. And so he gathered the people, he gathered the priests, he gathered the prophets, and he had them hear the word of the Lord. And he read in their hearing the words of the book of the covenant, which had come, which had been found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood by a pillar and he made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart, with all his soul, to perform the words of his covenants that were written in the book, and all the people took a stand for the, cover, for the covenant. And this is what Josiah did. He took a stand for the covenant, and Josiah goes and he tears down everything that his father had built, or that his grandfather, actually, Manasseh, had built. He goes, he tears them down, he destroys them, he does like Hezekiah did, and he wipes everything down. And if I can read to you here from uh, verse number 25 of 2 Kings chapter 23, here's what it reads of Josiah. Here's what it reads of Josiah. His father was a pagan, his grandfather was evil beyond evil, the cause for the, the upcoming exile, and Josiah, here's what's written of Josiah. 
now before him, before him. That means King David, King Hezekiah, all these good kings. Before him, there was no one like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to the, all the law of Moses, nor after him did any arise like him. That means there was no king before Josiah or after Josiah that had turned to the Lord with all his heart like Josiah. And yet, his father was a bad example and his grandfather was even a worse example. Worse example. And yet, Josiah did what? Josiah chose to follow God. He chose not to to follow in the way of his father and his grandfather. For it was Josiah's decision. It was Josiah's responsibility to choose to follow God. He couldn't, he couldn't say, hey, well, you know, I can't help it. It's what my daddy did. My daddy did it. It's what my daddy showed me. No, he chose not to accept that. He chose to hear the word of the Lord and to receive the word of the Lord and to do something about it. Joshua 24, 15 reads, Choose ye this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Those are the words of, Jos of, of Joshua. I'm sorry, I think I said Josiah. Joshua 24, 15. That's where that's written. Joshua says, choose ye this day. It's your choice. It's your choice to serve God, to follow God. And if you look carefully, we all know John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that whoever believes... Whoever believes, right, will not perish, but have everlasting life. In John 3, 18, same thing. Whoever believes will not be condemned. In John 3, 36, again, we're told that whoever believes in me will have everlasting life. And in uh, John 5, 24, again, whoever believes in me will not perish. John 6, 40, whoever believes shall live. In John 6, 47, again, whoever believes will not perish. Your belief is a choice. You can choose to either believe that Christ is Christ or you can choose not to believe. Josiah could have chose to walk in the ways of his father, Amon, and his grandfather, or he can choose to follow his heavenly father. See, we oftentimes get caught up in buying into, well, you know, I was mistreated. I was, uh, my, my, yes, your father did mistreat. Your father wasn't perfect. My father wasn't perfect. I shared a lot of wonderful things about him, but he still was not perfect. Why else did he at the age of 69 accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior? For as wonderful and kind as he was, there's something about my dad I didn't tell you. His father was an alcoholic. And my dad told me when he was a young man, not even a teenager, he had to sometimes go down to the neighborhood bar and carry his own father back to the house. And he said, I'm not going to do that to my kids. If a man who did not know Christ can make that stand and make that decision, how much more can you who have Christ, who have the power of the Holy Spirit, how much more are you equipped and better equipped, strengthened to do that, to stand for the Lord, to choose for your household this day who you will serve? As we get ready to close and have the musicians come up, you can sit here and say, you know, Roger, you had it easy. You know, your, your dad was a good dad. Your dad was a good example. Yeah, that's true. He was a good example. He was. I, I love my dad. I, I still can't, and as we struggled financially and had difficult times financially, and I, I love him. I, I love him. He was, he was a good dad. But how much more is your loving father towards you. Think about it. If my dad could do all these things and be without, and your father in heaven owns a cattle on a thousand hills, if he's willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice of sacrificing his son that you may live, what kind of, that's the kind of love that you have in your, love, in your heavenly father. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 31, and in the wilderness, where you saw how the Lord God carried you, as a man carries his son, in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Please stand to your feet.
He's carried you all the way to this place. Whatever your situation has been in your life as the altar workers come, whatever trouble you've had, whatever struggle, whatever hurt you've had, and maybe your father physically hurt you. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I am terribly sorry for that. He didn't know any better. He was tormented by demons. So was Josiah's father and grandfather. But you can change that. You are a new creation in Christ. And you can live for Christ new. This is why he says we must be born again. We need to stop carrying these things from our past. We were born again. I am new. I am no longer that person. I am no longer that, 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 that kid who, who had to hide from the door when the, the, the doorbell rang. I don't have to hide anymore. You don't have to hide anymore because you're new. He made you new. You're new in Christ. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, today could be that day. I want to read this verse to you again. Deuteronomy 131. And in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. God brought you to this place. However difficult your struggle has been, whatever lies you've been told, whatever lies you've been living, whatever lies that, that, that you've been holding on to, you don't need to anymore because you got to know there's a heavenly father who loves you and he wants to receive you today. In Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son, it reads that he stood there, saw his son from afar off, and he welcomed his son home. The Father welcomes you home today. Like I said, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, do it today. Come now. Come stand with one of these altar workers. They will pray with you. They will, they will, they will ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins and help you to invite Jesus into your life, to be Lord of your life. Come. Come. Come and accept Christ today. Psalm 68, 5, the Lord writes, He is a father to the fatherless. If you feel your father left you, abandoned you, and maybe he did, you feel like you've had no father, you do have a heavenly father. He loves you. If you have anything that you need your father to take care of, Come now. Come to the altar. If you need forgiveness, he'll forgive you. If you need healing, he'll heal you. If you need comfort, he will comfort you. If you need love, he'll love you. If you need to be held, he'll hold you. If you need an encouraging word, he'll speak to you. Come. This altar is open. This altar is open for everyone and anyone. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you for being omnipresent, for being omniscient, for being all loving, my God, for loving us when we haven't been able to love ourselves. You still love us. Now, Father, even when there's an eclipse and all is dark, the sun is still shining bright. The sun doesn't stop working and you don't stop working. You keep burning bright for us. You keep calling us to you. You keep showing us the way. So, Father, I ask that if, if there's anybody here, my Lord, who's hurting and struggling, that they could come and receive from you. I ask, Lord, blessings upon everyone here. Bless all the men to, Father, to draw closer to you, that they may become better fathers, that they may be loving and considerate to men who will nurture, train, and develop according to your will, not to anything that maybe we have been given a poor example of, but that we would just follow you, my God, in the way you want us to go. We give you praise, my Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Gone are the chains that will hold.